long-form uh, detention systems. I'd like to introduce our uh, panel uh, and our moderator, uh, Sam Witten, uh, who's a, uh, a former pr principal deputy assistant secretary of state for population, refugees, and migration, and is currently counsel at Arnold and Porter. Um, one of the panel participants, Steve Martin, former general counsel of the Texas prison system, unfortunately fell ill uh, last night, so is unable to uh, join us today, but I'm sure that you'll find that uh, we'll have an excellent and spirited discussion uh, with quite an accomplished panel. So, Sam, please, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Um, and thanks to Human Rights First for convening this day. I know a lot of great work and energy has gone into it, and I'm very grateful that they have asked me to, uh, to join and to engage in this very important discussion about conditions in detention facilities. Um, before I introduce the panel, I thought I'd give two aspects of perspective on this. Uh, one is just, uh, as I mentioned to my co-panelists here, I have a background on this issue of conditions of detention that's a little off to the side. Uh, I know most of you are expert in the U.S. immigration system and detention. When I was at the State Department, the last three years that I was there, I spent a lot of time uh, as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Refugee Bureau going around the world and talking to countries and governments and detention officials about the way that they handled refugees when they had arrived in their borders and issues of their conditions of detention. And in particular, I was the guy that went to Lebanon in 2008 and maybe nine or nine uh, to talk to them about the way that they handled the infusion of Iraqis who had fled Iraq and traveled into Lebanon. The Lebanese reacted by putting them in jail. So this was all very familiar to me. And when I had my first discussions with Human Rights First about the issue after I'd left government, uh, this was sort of a very logical transition for me to come from talking around the world about the way other governments handle these very interesting and complicated issues to then uh, being in touch with Human Rights First and reading the good reports and being educated on the U.S. domestic system. So before I introduce our panelists, I just have one minute of some statistics. And I know that many of you who've been here earlier in the day have been exposed to some of this already. But um, just a, a crib sheet. Um, and I'm sure Gary will tell me if any of these numbers are inaccurate. Uh, ICE has uh, about 34,000 beds in jails and jail-like facilities across the country. 50% more or less are in actual jails. In the course of a given year, about 400,000 individuals are detained by ICE, including a whole variety of folks. As you'd imagine, ICE handles uh, everything from asylum seekers, legal immigrants who've overstayed their visas, recent border crossers, lawful permanent residents convicted of crimes, everything from simple drug possessions to more serious, and some who've completed their sentences. And the chronology, as we'll hear from our panelists, really when the Obama administration stepped in in 2009, a lot of discussion, a lot of energy reports, testimony on the issue of conditions of confinement. So with that, broad introduction without getting into all the details because my co-panelists will go there. I'll introduce now each of the first speakers, the three speakers, and then I've asked each to speak for 10 or 12 minutes because I know this is a very engaged group. A lot of you are working in the area. You'll have your own perspective on the issues and you'll want to ask questions or make comments, agree, disagree with things that you've heard on the panel. So with that set up, let me tell you who we have. We have a, a terrific panel. Unfortunately, as, as we just heard, Steve is, uh, Martin is unavailable because of illness. Uh, we have uh, first, our first speaker, and I think we've, am I right, Dara? Dara Skyro from the uh, New York City Department of Corrections. Uh, Dara served previously, she's currently the commissioner of the New York City Department of Correction, previously special advisor to DHS Secretary Napolitano, and was the first director of the Office of Detention Policy and Planning within ICE. She also served as the director of Arizona Department of Corrections and Missouri Department, or Missouri, sorry, the Department of Corrections. <laughs> she was warden and later commissioner of the St. Louis City Division of Corrections, uh, one of the top uh, 
corrections officials in the U.S., and we're very fortunate that she was able to come and, and join us. Then Gary will speak, Gary Mead, who um, uh, I will tell you has been working in this field for many years and has announced his retirement, so this is one of his last uh, public engagements. I think you're in office for another three or four weeks, two or three weeks. Gary's the Executive Associate Director for Enforcement and Removal Operations at ICE. Uh, he oversees a $2.5 billion budget and over 8,300 employees. Arrow's role, his, his component of DHS's role is to promote public safety and national security by removing national security threats, high-risk criminal aliens, illegal alien fugitives and absconders, and ensuring safe and effective custody management for more than 30,000 aliens detained uh, in custody each day. A long and distinguished career, um, beginning in 1974 with the Marshal Service going through a long series of portfolios within the U.S. government that is, is a credit to uh, just tremendous commitment and uh, uh, really a fabulous, uh, fabulous background to have the position he's in and it's made great contributions. And finally, uh, Margot Schlanger, professor of law, University of Michigan Law School, a former officer for civil rights and civil liberties at DHS. Uh, Margot is appearing today in her capacity as counsel to DHS Secretary Napolitano. She returned uh, to the University of Michigan a year ago after a two-year leave during which she served as the presidentially appointed officer for civil rights and civil liberties at DHS. She brings to the University of Michigan Law School expertise in civil rights, prison reform, torts, and empirical legal, dis legal studies. She also heads the Civil Rights Litigation Clearinghouse. She has been a professor at WashU in St. Louis and an assistant professor at Harvard. So with that, I'll ask Dora to open Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I, uh, I had the extraordinary opportunity uh, at the beginning of the Obama administration to serve with Secretary Napolitano and author, uh, ultimately, the report on reforming civil detention. My charge was straightforward and, two, and had two parts. It was to focus on the significant growth in immigrant de immigration detention and arrest policies at ICE and then to do whatever we could to improve the interaction between ICE and the aliens who were being held pending the removal or relief determinations. The report was different. Um, it wasn't, um, it was looking at what was civil about detention. What were the differences between civil and criminal uh, incarceration? And, uh, and how to make the most civil, civil system possible. Um, one of the things that was striking in my report is I read many documents promulgated by, by government and others is that there was striking similarity. There was a remarkable amount of agreement both inside government and outside about a number of the, the attributes, the strengths, and also the challenges uh, that lay ahead. My approach reflected something of my own training it, it was laden with a lot of data, but it was also approached in somewhat of an ethnographic way, where I just dove into the field, traveled the country, went to a number of facilities, and talked to everybody who had any involvement in, in the system as, as a consumer, as someone who was incarcerated, as someone who was involved in, uh, in government. Just restating a couple uh, things that have been said this morning already, and that is that that the purpose of civil detention is expressly not for the purpose of punishment. And I think we'll look forward this afternoon to talking a little bit about, well, what really is the difference between civil and criminal uh, incarceration? I can tell you as the jailer in the room, having run both, both jail systems and prison systems, that the law is not that different between individuals who are innocent, not yet proven guilty in the criminal system, and those who have been pled or proven guilty. And because so much of the civil system has relied on the model that was predicated by the criminal justice system, that there's been quite a bit of confusion, I think largely by the 
by the public. You know, looks like a duck, quacks like a duck. If they're being held in jails, they must be dangerous uh, and they must be managed in a particular uh, way. In writing the report, um, my hope, one I think you'll hear has largely been realized, is that the assessment would not be viewed as a criticism of what is and what had been, but where were the opportunities for improvement? Where, were the, where, were the, where was the commonality? And what good could we make out of, of uh, what it is that we were grappling with? You know, there was this marked um, change in government from catch and um, release to catch and remove. And overnight, um, the, the number of beds that were required to support that shift in governance uh, changed appreciably. And so uh, those beds that were available, beds as we've heard discussed this morning, either operated by sheriffs, although many of them actually built by the private sector uh, on behalf of, of sheriffs or owned and operated by the private sector, uh, have been the, the whole of the way in which um, the reforms had been carried out uh, until the, until the uh, adoption of a number of policies that Gary will talk about in greater detail. I think it's worthwhile to talk about the population for a moment, and I hasten to add an apology in advance, because whenever you talk about groups as groups, then you lose all the important nuances of individuals. But having said that, and having had the opportunity to work with both pretrial prisoners, sentenced to inmates, and those who are civilly held, in general, it's my experience, and I think for many others in the room who have similar experiences, there are some appreciable differences. Uh, and those appreciable differences really should be informing a lot of the, the conversation that we continue to have on these important issues. Criminal history. They have no experience with incarceration. And so as you might expect, the way that they experience incapacitation is a little bit different than individuals who have had some exposure, which is not to say that it's never easy or that it's ever pleasant or something that you get used to. It is still a very different experience. The vast majority of the civil detainees with whom I encountered and others that I have, I've worked with um, in the years since they, are, they, by and large, come from intact families. They maintain homes. They are gainfully employed. In essence, they have many of the social skills that you frequently don't see for individuals who are disenfranchised and engaged in the criminal justice system. And that, in particular, I think, informs some of the conversation about for those, as a matter of law, who must be detained pending decisions of removal or relief, what really is necessary in the context of detention? And I'm going to toggle back for a moment to me as the sociologist, um, which is to, to refer you to an, an old treatise written by Goffman called Total Institutions, where there was a topology about several different kinds of systems that are set up for individuals, some of whom come voluntarily to a system, uh, and those who find themselves members uh, as a result of an involuntary selection. And, and so total institutions, by and large, are focused on achieving optimal efficiency, not so much necessarily effectiveness. Um, for example, in the criminal justice world, it's about care, custody, and control. It's about how do you manage the largest number of people with the fewest number of incidents. And so most of the measures are largely outputs and not outcomes. The focus in, under that model is not about reentry, about discharge planning and preparation. It doesn't have a heavy case management component, much as we've heard uh, as being useful for those who are civilly detained and may have the good fortune to to stay in this country or need to be ready to return to their home. The, this population, the civilly detained, um, when they come into facilities that are quite different, um, they experience it differently, as I said. In the report, as I collected my data and uh, cataloged experiences, I started to think about it in a, in a framework 
which then became the template for reform. And I just briefly want to touch on, um, on this seven-part analysis because I think um, as, you, as you hear the report outs from, from Gary and Margo, you'll hear some of that thinking uh, in the work that's been accomplished, which is considerable, as well as the work that's yet to be done by all of us. There is first and foremost population management, which really speaks to what are the continuum and controls? What are the core assumptions about how you're going to manage individuals? Um, and, and I know that can sound like a fairly callous characterization, but as the jailer, that's the way in which we think about things. And so as we've spent a lot of this morning talking about alternatives to detention, so it is that there are terrific opportunities to think about what are the least restrictive environments in which, in which government can successfully achieve uh, its mandates. And so um, whether, whether law permits it or risk assessments inform it, where someone goes in the continuum is really what population management is all about. It also speaks when you're inside of a facility does everyone need to be locked down? Does everyone need to be surrounded with rolls and rolls of razor ribbon? Does everyone have to have every decision made for them every minute of the day, as is frequently the case with those who are in the criminal justice system? And so alternatives to detention is, is a big part of population management, both in the civil and the criminal uh, conversations. Detention management really speaks to the core operating assumptions that impact the daily conditions of detention. And so some of what we've heard uh, about in the past and that you'll be hearing about today is how do you humanize, how do you make more civil the impact of, of the incarceration on individuals who must be detained? And so whether it's holding, um, whether or not you have an opportunity to wear personal clothes or prepare your own food, launder your own clothing, have freedom of movement in a facility, have opportunity to rejoin family members if more than one of more than one family member is, is picked up together. That's all part of, of those core operating principles. Programs management has particular importance in both worlds as well. And this is how we start to customize the, the, the detention or the supervision that's in the community so as to meet both the assessed needs and the assessed risks of those individuals who, who are under the care uh, and responsibility of government. One of the most important programs, of course, is healthcare, because for any population that doesn't have the freedom of movement to select their own care, they are wholly dependent on government for, for their physical and their, their mental well-being. Special populations is, is particularly pertinent to the civil conversation as it is to for, for those who are criminally uh, confined. And, and here there are some special nuances as well. We've touched through today's program about asylum seekers. Well, in the world of civil detention, that, that's a group that has really unique um, requirements of, of a variety of kinds that um, can and should be addressed through the civil detention process. Similarly, if you're a woman or members of a family with minor children, those are other kinds of special populations. The elderly, the infirm, they're not pronounced in the civilly detained group, and yet they are members of the group, and we, of course, have clear responsibilities to them as well. Last, and, and I think most, most important for any of us who are in government or involved in making good government become good governance, is the accountability conversation. To what extent is what we do tra is transparent? To what extent are we accountable to ourselves and others? To what degree are we congruent with, with our stated missions, our activities, and our ultimate outcomes? Uh, and so I'm really delighted to, to be here today. Uh, and can't wait to hear your questions and comments so that I too can continue to learn. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, we could spend uh, all of the afternoon, well into the evening, and probably the rest of the week talking about uh, immigration detention. So what I thought I would try and do is just summarize very quickly uh, many of the things that have been accomplished since uh, Dora came out with her report in 2009, and then uh, mention a few of the things that are still outstanding and, and in place.
progress. And I guess I'd just like to begin by saying that uh, my mission can be uh, even further simplified. Yours, yours was pretty pared down, but our mission really is to uh, remove from the country people who have been determined to be here unlawfully. I mean, that, that is ICE's mission. That is my specific mission. And I can tell you that detention is just one tool that we use to do that. And if it wasn't, uh, if it was possible to remove the people who have been determined to be here unlawfully without detaining any of them, that would be fine with us. Uh, detention, in, in our opinion, is, is not a means uh, that needs to be perpetuated because it's something we like to do. Uh, and, and we're actually uh, hopeful that uh, civil immigration reform will help perhaps uh, change some of the demographics in terms of who we end up putting in detention. Uh, I can tell you, for example, that uh, of the 33,000 or so that we have in detention today, 96% uh, are either there because of mandatory detention per law or they've been convicted of some other crime uh, in addition to being here potentially unlawfully. So uh, we don't have a lot of people uh, in detention today uh, who are sort of discretionary, people that we, we detain for reasons other than law or having had a criminal conviction. Um, since 2009, we've really focused very hard to, to make sure that the conditions we hold people under are as commensurate with the nature of their proceedings, the nature of their individual circumstances as possible. Uh, big accomplishment is the fact that we now have about 90% of the people in detention in 64 facilities. By consolidating people into fewer facilities, it gives us the ability to apply greater oversight and to make sure that you know, the conditions are what we would like them to be. Uh, as part of that oversight process, we've created something called detention service managers. Uh, these are full-time employees who are in our largest facilities. They cover on a daily basis about 80% of those detained, and it's their job to make sure that on a daily basis standards are being followed. Uh, they conduct daily, weekly, monthly checks, uh, and they submit weekly reports telling us what's going on in each of those facilities. Uh, we've also added uh, something called field medical coordinators. These are public health service officers who are assigned to each of our field offices, separate and apart from providing care in the facilities, but to advise our staffs in the field on medical issues in terms of who should be detained, who should be released for humanitarian reasons, and whether or not the quality of care individuals are getting is appropriate to their medical conditions. Uh, we also have created, since 2009, the Office of Detention Oversight. Uh, this office reports to the Office of Professional Responsibility, separate from my organization, and they do their own inspections of facilities, either on a random basis or as a result of some specific issue. Uh, and they uh, provide the reports to us for action. Uh, we also continue to do our annual inspections uh, by a private contractor, and we are also uh, partners with and, and sometimes assisting CRCL with the reviews they do. Inspector General also does reviews of our facilities. At the end of which, uh, approximately 99.1% of all the standards are found to be in compliance in our major facilities. So the level of oversight, I think, has had the desired effect, which is to make sure that they are in compliance with standards. Uh, other things that we've done since then, we have just completed the nationwide rollout of our automated risk classification tool. Uh, this allows us to, in an automated way, and one should be there that they don't have any special vulnerabilities that would make uh, prosecutorial discretion a better alternative for them. Uh, it's very useful in identifying special vulnerabilities. So that has been totally uh, implemented. Uh, we implemented a detainee transfer policy, uh, which uh, prevents us from moving people from the place of arrest to some other part of the country unless there are very clearly uh, defined uh, extenuating circumstances uh, that would allow us to do that. So that keeps people closer to their attorneys, their families, uh, whatever ties to the community they may have. So that, that has been very successful. On the question of asylum seekers, uh, we implemented a 
uh, parole policy, which makes it incumbent upon us to offer parole to people who are here uh, as recent arrivals. Uh, and if we can determine that, one, they, they have no criminal history, and two, uh, they have a, a known identity, uh, the onus is on us to release rather than detain. And we've released about 80% of the people who have been subject to that policy. The other 20% are people who, as I said, either have a criminal history that would make that unwise, or we've been unable to uh, confirm their identities. Uh, the issue of having facilities that are more civil in nature, uh, we now have over 10% of our total population in facilities that have been specifically designed for them. Uh, if any of you have had the opportunity to visit uh, the newest facility, uh, the Carnes facility in Texas, uh, I think you will say that or agree that that is uh, an appropriate facility for people who pose no threat to each other or uh, have criminal histories. Uh, they have virtually 24 hour a day freedom of access. Uh, they have private rooms with private baths, uh, 24, access, 24 hour access to medical facilities, uh, beach volleyball, uh, AstroTurf soccer courts, uh, educational facilities, and, and other things. It, it's quite an unusual facility. But in addition to Carnes, we also have Farmville, Delaney Hall in Brooklyn, or I'm sorry, in New Jersey, Music in California, and the two that we began with, the Hutto facility and the Broward facility. And you've got pictures of some of them in the handouts that uh, we, we gave you. Uh, the emphasis on uh, detainee medical care has never been higher. Uh, and uh, while we still have some unfortunate circumstances, uh, things have improved dramatically. Um, in fiscal year, uh, 2012, the one that just completed, uh, we unfortunately had eight detainee deaths, uh, but that's the lowest number of deaths that we've ever had, and all of those were as a result of pre-existing conditions that uh, we either were unaware of or, or just uh, couldn't treat quickly enough uh, to present the, uh, prevent the death. Uh, we've been particularly concerned about suicides, and, I, and I, I'm hesitant to mention this, but we have not had a suicide uh, in over two years. Uh, Alternatives to detention has become an extremely important and large part of what we do. I think Julie Myers was here earlier this morning and earlier today may have talked about it. Uh, we now have over 23,000 people on some form of alternative, and uh, that number is probably up by five or 6,000 from uh, previous years. So we do make great use of that. Uh, we are also trying to make sure that people are not in detention for excessive periods of time. Right now, the average length of stay for all types of people in detention uh, is around 28 days. Uh, and I can tell you that about 50% of the people in detention are there for less than eight days, and 75% are there for less than 30 days. For those that are in detention, uh, whether it's for a few days or longer, we've put in place a number of things to make sure that they have a voice in terms of bringing forward issues of concern. Uh, we now have a nationwide uh, detainee call center where uh, detainees can call uh, into our headquarters. It's, it's staffed by knowledgeable officers who can answer questions such as, when is my hearing coming up? Uh, I have a grievance that's not being answered. Uh, can you put me in, in touch with pro bono uh, legal services? Any questions that they have are answered by the call center in addition to uh, any questions that are being answered by our staff that visits the facilities. Uh, we've implemented a zero tolerance sexual assault policy. There are posters up in all of the facilities as well as a 1-800 number where detainees who either believe that they've been the victims of sexual assault or believe that they've seen it uh, can call that 1-800 number. Uh, we also uh, implemented since 2009 uh, something that, that addressed a very serious concern which is, was that Prior to the detainee transfer policy uh, in particular, it was difficult to know where someone was being detained. Uh, we implemented an online detainee locator system where individuals can go to that system with an A number or certain biographic information and determine real time where people are being detained. Uh, it's getting still about 100,000 inquiries a month. Uh, so that has been very, very effective for not only family members, but attorneys and others to keep track of where people are. Uh, just a couple more things. Uh, the demographics of who we detain uh, have changed dramatically since 2009, and that 
uh, to some extent, increases the challenges of, of, as we go forward with detention reform. About 65% of the people in detention have been convicted of some other crime. Uh, that's up, to, up from probably less than 50% in 2009. Uh, I think that percentage will continue to, to rise as we focus on criminal aliens and people uh, who pose a clear threat to our neighborhoods. Uh, you've, you've heard about our immigration enforcement priorities. Uh, first and foremost are criminal aliens. Second are fugitives. Uh, third are people who have been removed multiple times. And fourth are recent border crossers. Uh, our removals last year tracked at about 96% of them fitting into one of those categories with about 55% being convicted criminals. Our detention population mirrors that almost exactly. About 95% of the people in detention are either convicted criminals, fugitives, re-entrants, or recent border crossers who are there because uh, as an expedited removal case, their detention is mandatory. Um, and, and lastly, the other 4% uh, are typically uh, people who are uh, in the process of being evaluated as to, as to just what their status truly is. Um, things that, that we haven't quite gotten as far as we would like just yet, uh, clearly uh, we have not moved uh, our new detention standards into as many facilities as we had hoped. Uh, our PBNDS 2011 standards are implemented in about six of our largest facilities and we continue to work to move those forward as aggressively as we can. Uh, we are working on uh, our own version of PREA regulations and standards and we hopefully will be moving forward on those shortly and we are working on a, uh, a very expansive parental rights policy that will help make sure that people in detention, people in removal proceedings uh, do not uh, unnecessarily uh, have their parental rights uh, forfeited. So that, that's a lot. Uh, there's more I could talk about, but maybe th that list of things will uh, generate some questions, and I look forward to taking those. Okay, so um, so thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a privilege to be here, and it's it's been a privilege also. I spent two years running um, the Civil Rights Office at DHS in DHS headquarters, and I've for in the year and a half since I've been um, a kind of a part-time advisor to the Secretary on a variety of issues, including a bunch of detention issues. Um, so what I think I will do here is um, uh, talk a little bit about oversight in general um, and in some specifics. I, let, me, um, let me just point out one fact that, maybe two statistics that might be useful to add to the conversation. One is to keep in mind that the non-detained docket, you know, the detention, um, the detention uh, numbers are, you've been hearing about all day, 34, 33,000. Um, uh, the non-detained docket is right now 1.7 million. So the, the number of people who are in proceedings who are not in detention completely dwarfs the number who are in detention. And you have to keep that in mind, that, that there's these two different groups of people who are in proceedings, a small number who move reasonably fast through the system, although not all of them are moving fast through the system, but who are in general moving quickly through the system who are in the detained docket, and a very, very large number who are moving very slowly through the system, um, uh, who are an appreciable portion, although not you know, anything close to a majority, of the 11 million people here out of status today. So, so I just point that out to keep in mind that you want to make sure that, that you know that it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an important group, the in detention, but we want to do things that solve their issues without um, muddying what goes on for everybody else as well. The other thing that's perhaps useful is to know that about half of the people who are in detention um, uh, are post-final order. So that's just a useful thing. They've had, that doesn't mean that they no longer have an appeal or other kinds of rights that they are going through the, um, the hearings on, but they've had an immigration judge say, yeah, you need to be removed, and that's about 50% of the population. The, the other statistic that to me is important is just remember that about half of the people um, who are released from detention spent fewer than nine days there. 
so that it's in large part, but only large part, a very short-term set of facilities. And then there's a chunk of people who are there for an appreciable length of time. And that creates um, management challenges that are very familiar to people who run jails, um, which also have this kind of churn for some piece and longer-term population for others. But we have to keep that in mind. We have to have solutions that um, allow people to, um, who are just there short term to kind of get their business done and leave, but that are humane and appropriate for the other folks. All right, so um, I guess what I want to say about oversight is that it's really important to have two different kinds of oversight going on and to have oversight going on at a variety of different levels in the organization. And that that has been the basic approach. And no doubt we could improve it, but that has been the basic approach. So the two different kinds of oversight that you want to have in general are routine oversight, where there are people who are out there seeing if everything is going OK, just as a matter of course. Um, this could be management by walking around, which is the basic um, approach of the detention service managers. Um, it can also be, you know, just generic, general sort of um, private companies that ICE contracts with who do an annual inspection also do that kind of oversight. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a general check-in. But then you also want to have the possibility of fire alarm kind of oversight. You want to have a set of more intense scrutiny, a set of more intense um, scrutiny kinds of approaches that get summoned up when something looks like it's either risky or going wrong. And um, so at ICE, that's done by ODO, uh, the Office of Detention Oversight. Um, which is largely a, um, a, a specific incident-driven review process, although they also do some uh, kind of um, uh, protocol-based compliance reviews, too, that I, I don't understand their protocols entirely, but they're sometimes based on sort of assessment of risks and so on. It's also the way that, that CRCL, my former office, the Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, does its oversight. Those are complaint-driven. Um, in large part, but also occasionally based on other things that aren't complaints, but that are uh, some kind of a, a signal that something might be a problem. And so um, uh, you want to build an oversight system that has room for both of those and that has a lot of people who can provide those triggers in particular for the fire alarm kind of oversight. So on that, um, uh, you have, for example, uh, one of the things Gary didn't mention was the system of death notifications. So about, oh, I don't know, three years ago, about three years ago, ICE started, there's a system of people within DHS and ICE who get notified if a detainee dies. And, you know, knock wood, this number will stay very small, but a death is obviously a huge incident. And so you want to make sure that when something like that happens, if it's a, a signal that there's something that's really deeply wrong in a system, you want a variety of people to sort of be going in and dealing um, with that thing that is deeply wrong. And so uh, CRCL is one of the offices that gets notice of detainee deaths. And there are a variety of others, all of whom have some kind of oversight responsibility and an ability to scrutinize what went on at that facility that led to what we hope was not a preventable death, but what might have been a preventable death. So that's an example. Another example is the detainee hotline, which is a very new reform and one I'm really happy about. Because again, that provides a method by which the fire alarm type oversight can be implemented. Um, uh, likewise, um, the online detainee locator system, which doesn't sound like an oversight mechanism at all, kind of functions as one in some ways because it provides families a way, this is particularly true with people who have mental health issues, it can provide families a way of finding out where their family member is and, and, and getting to ICE the information that might otherwise be missing about the needs of that person. Um, so that the idea is to build both of these at once, the general oversight mechanisms, the fire alarm uh, oversight mechanisms, and all of them triggerable at a variety of places and in a variety of ways throughout the organization, both ICE and main DHS as well. Um, and then sometimes you'll end up with something, you know, kind of more, a little less, um, less by a built-in methodology and more really triggered by some kind of a fire alarm. So 
Um, one of the projects that I've been working on uh, pretty intensely for the past little bit, maybe week or two, maybe two weeks, is um, uh, solitary confinement, segregation in ICE detention. So that's, um, as the Secretary has announced, that's an ongoing short-term review um, where uh, the department and ICE are making sure that the policies that are in place are being followed and that the, um, the, if it turns out on that review that those policies need amendments, that there is care paid to that and that those amendments take place. So that's a, again, that's like a fire alarm kind of a thing, but one of the things um, that some of those fire alarm type oversight mechanisms do is they realize what kind of routine oversight might be useful. Um, ICE has been working, for example, on a set of uh, medical care checklists that can help lead to better inspection of medical care. And I think that came out in some ways of some of the fire alarm sorts of oversight moments. So, um, so that's the general system. And um, uh, I think that as a person who's been thinking about oversight mechanisms in, in incarceral kinds of facilities for a long time, you know, they have the obvious obstacle to oversight, which is that they are behind walls, right? That's the reason that normal, that normal oversight has to be so robust is because they are behind gates. They are, they are invisible to the population. And so um, I've been thinking about that for a, a good long time now, both in jails and prisons and, and um, in the past five years, four years in ICE detention. And this seems to me to be the right approach, the general oversight, the fire alarm oversight, the variety of methods that trigger all of that um, looking. Uh, and so that's been the approach. So I think with that, I'll stop. Great, uh, that'll be helpful. I don't know actually the mechanics for how people can stand and ask questions if they're mic'd or, or what, but let me, while, while someone identifies that mechanism, uh, let me open with a question uh, of my own. I, you know, as we, uh, and this touches on everyone's comments, I think, here on the panel, uh, it seems to me there are two broad clusters of issues. One is the length of confinement, which you've addressed with some statistics about who the likely uh, categories are to be in, in the facilities the longest time and how many are released. And the second is conditions of confinement. Once they're there, and, uh, and Gary mentioned the Carnes facility in Texas as perhaps sort of a, if, if funding were there and uh, logistics made it possible, perhaps a good model for the future. And maybe we could come back to that a little bit um, as to whether that is sort of an island or whether that is, is going to spread more. But I, I want to start, if we could, with the length of time because one of the statistics um, if I heard correctly, and I'm not sure that I got all the numbers right, 75% of those in detention facilities are released in under 30 days. Is that right? If you flip that around, that means that 25% are held for more than 30 days. So the question that I have, and it, it's seeking a specific answer, is what would be needed to get that number down, the 25% number down and down and down? Is it uh, is it a question of uh, decision makers, adjudicators uh, being uh, inadequate? What, what surge, would it be resources, people, different types of facilities, different locations? How can that number get down? Because ideally, we, we take as a given that there are certain individuals that credibly can be detained under any system for the reasons that you outlined. So then we try to figure out how to reduce the amount of time and presumably there are specifics that all of you have thought about at some length, uh, what would be needed? So let me turn that very broad question, but looking for specific answers. So and any of you that might comment on that? Well, you know, I, I, one of the reasons that people are in detention uh, extended periods of time, and, and while I can't remember all the numbers, but I, I think like 90% are out within 100 days or so. Uh, it's a very, very small percentage that are there for a long period of time, but it's almost always driven by the nature of their, the due process that they're availing themselves of in terms of immigration. And, uh, you know, there are a number of choke points in that, uh, one of which is, is the, you know, finite number of immigration judges. And, and while they do uh, yeoman work of, of prioritizing the cases uh, in detention, 
uh, as we were saying, the average length of stay is only 28 days, the time that someone could wait on the, the non-detained docket to get through their uh, immigration process could be years. Uh, and so the, the judges do a good job, but uh, you know that that is one of the choke points that uh, we have a limited number of immigration judges. Uh, people uh, have every right and, and should avail themselves of the entire number of due process options, and that can take some time. Let me just add that um, a piece of this issue is mandatory detention. Right there, there's some portion of that population that, if ICE were simply doing a risk assessment, might not need to stay in detention, but mandatory detention is congressional policy. And I'd like to just, you, you, go ahead, Dor. Um, it sounds like the one of the very promising reforms that Gary announced, which is the, the practice now of not moving individuals um, from the place where they were first detained to locations that are much further away. One of the, the challenges, and it, just to bridge over from some of this morning's conversation, relatively few in who are civilly de detained are represented because as we pointed out this morning, representation is uh, publicly funded representation is not a right afforded to those who are civilly held where it, where it is uh, for, for criminally held where there's a likelihood of incarceration. Um, and so to keep people where, they, where they're close to counsel is certainly going to help to some extent, but, but as a group, that's still a small group. Uh, and I know the next panel will be talking further about pro bono. I'd like to flip your question to the other side, which is that's a lot of people who are in the system for as many as 30 days. And where, where the results are fairly straightforward, um, that's, that's a long time to be, to be held under what are still very trying circumstances. Uh, and so I know the next panel is also going to be talking about the legal orientation program, which I think really helps uh, individuals who don't necessarily have a full understanding of, of what rights they may have and what rights are, are not afforded to them, uh, help them to facilitate their, their decision making more than they do right now. And, and you know, Dora's right about that. I mean, the people who, who you know, can avail themselves of, of legal representation uh, tend to, and this, this is anecdotal, I don't have any statistics, but I believe tend to move through the system quicker. Uh, and so we've tried to, working with AILA and, and others, make as much legal information available as we can. We have a number of, of different presentations uh, that, that are now available. Uh, to detainees as well as you know uh, law libraries with with immigration materials but but that is that is true uh, and and you know afforded uh, attorneys at, at government expense let's open it up I don't know there oh they're walking mics good hi good afternoon and if you uh, could say say your name and your affiliation sure absolutely my name is Laura Markle Downton I'm here with the National Religious Campaign Against Torture uh, representing our over 320 religious organizations uh, throughout the country. And I wanted to go back, uh, you had mentioned the, the recent uh, New York Times report about the use of solitary confinement in immigration detention facilities. This is, of course, a major concern uh, to us uh, who ascribe to the UN standards of understanding that the use of solitary confinement for more than 15 days accounts to uh, torture and leads to permanent uh, psychological damage uh, oftentimes uh, leading to uh, self-mutilation and suicide and of course has no place in, in, in any of our detention facilities. So I wanted to ask specifically what is planned for specific and immediate action on behalf of ICE uh, to ensure that this practice uh, is not used uh, again in uh, detention facilities. Oh, so why don't you go first? <laughs> um, uh, well, as I, as I mentioned, the, the Secretary and, um, and Director Morton have uh, undertaken to do a joint review of what is, um, is, of what is going on. There are a set of uh, fairly robust standards governing the use of solitary confinement 
um, in ICE detention. There are rules about how long people can be there. There are rules about what can get them there. There are rules about the conditions of confinement when they are there, including um, mental health screening, medical care screening, access to exercise, access to fresh air, and, and the like. Um, so, this so, so this review is both a review of um, a really sort of a review of how those policies are working in practice, something that ICE keeps pretty careful track of and has weekly reporting on, but just an extra layer of oversight on that, as well as a review of whether the policies are sufficiently robust. And that's what's going on. And just, just to follow up, I, you know, I, I wouldn't want to mislead you to say that uh, ICE will discontinue the use of uh, segregation. Uh, about 55% of the 400 people that are in segregation on any given day uh, are in there for, for various disciplinary reasons. And when you consider, as I said, that about 65% of the people that we have in detention have been convicted of other crimes, uh, and, and we can certainly you know, de debate at what level a misdemeanor is, is serious and isn't, uh, a good number of them are coming out of state prisons and federal prisons and do pose significant threats to, to others and, and staff. Uh, and uh, I think it would be somewhat naive to think that uh, there are never going to be disciplinary situations where they don't need to be separated. And in fact, there, there are a number uh, in uh, segregation who uh, have, have asked to be there uh, for either their own protection or because they know from, from the time they spent in state prisons and elsewhere, they just don't do well in general populations. So, you know, I, I think we, we need to look at uh, those that are there, uh, make sure that it's appropriate for them to be there, make sure our policies provide the oversight to, to get them out as quickly as possible, assuming it was appropriate to put them there, but to, to believe that particularly as we move towards a more criminal population, that we're not going to have people in segregation. I, I just don't think you're going to see that. I, I will add one other thing that I should have started us off with, which is that um, uh, it is definitely the department's approach to, to solitary confinement that it should be used um, as a last resort for as short a time as possible. And so um, that is the overarching approach. Um, and where that has left us right now is that at about 1% of the population, which compared to uh, jails and prisons is very low. But 1%, that doesn't mean that 1% is the necessarily the right number. I just say it is, it is very low compared to other carceral settings. Go ahead, follow could follow up briefly. Yeah, just just one brief uh, comment and follow up, which is uh, in looking at the the criminal system, um, there have been dramatic strides made uh, in states around the country to dramatically reduce the use of solitary confinement, resulting in actually increased uh, security and safety both for staff and for those incarcerated um, by using alternative, more humane uh, forms of of management. So I just want to make sure that we're also clear within this conversation that uh, solitary confinement uh, in any facility is not inevitably leading to greater safety for, for folks involved. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess beyond, um, beyond review, I, I would be helpful to hear further information about what I specifically will do to ensure that uh, where there are cases in which folks are being held in solitary uh, segregation for a prolonged amount of time, that they will be removed from segregation. What, what, specifically, uh, what specifically will be done in order to ensure that that happens? Well, one of the things that uh, the review is going to focus on is uh, something that you just said. You know, uh, are there uh, other alternatives uh, to segregation in, in the more classic sense? I mean. For example, um, you know, if, if we have people in segregation who are there uh, for protective custody rather than a, a disciplinary infraction, uh, you know, is there a way to have them have you know, greater outdoor recreation collectively uh, so that they, in effect, are not in segregation anymore, but they are in some separate part of the facility uh, that, that addresses whatever their, their protection issue is? So we're, we're looking at that. Uh, and, 
you know, as Margot said, just to, to make sure that we've got more, as many reviews as necessary, uh, as timely as necessary, to ensure that one, people going into SEG, it's appropriate for them to be there, and two, they get out just as soon as they can. And, and as I just said, you know, uh, you know, are there facilities where, you know, we, we can do something different than the traditional SEG? And we're, you know, and, and we, part of the problem with, with immigration in, in general is that you often find yourself um, at, in conflict with your own policies. I said earlier we have, we have a detainee transfer policy that mitigates against moving people. Well, someone may have a very legitimate reason to be in segregation, and they're in a facility where, uh, let me say this, there may be a facility somewhere else in the country where th there's a better alternative for them. You know, and I have to wrestle with the question of, do I move them from New York to Florida uh, to, to take advantage of, of something that's more appropriate for them, or do I leave them you know, in, in New York? So it, you know, we're aware of some of those contradictions, and, and I think as part of the policy review, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully address some of those. I, I, I will say that long-term segregation in ICE facilities is, is, is really very rare. That doesn't mean that I'm doubting the approach that you're coming at this with, just to be clear, but it is, it is very rare. The, the, the vast majority of the uses of segregation, the vast majority, are very short-term. Over here. Uh, Ken Mayo, I'm a clinical professor at LSU Law School in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I run an immigration clinic down there. And um, w one of the questions uh, that I have for Mr. Mead is um, generally kind of the decisions that go into locating detention centers. And as we go forward, building uh, new, uh, kinder, gentler detention centers like this one in Carnes County, <laughs> Texas, that looks so sweet. Um, has anyone looked at how many immigration lawyers there are in and around Carnes County, Texas, to determine whether any of these people will actually have an effective access to a lawyer? I, I can't answer that specifically. It is in the San Antonio field office's area of responsibility, uh, and it was positioned there because of the, uh, you're, you're probably aware, the extremely large number of recent border crossers that are given to us by the Border Patrol who are subject to mandatory detention, uh, most of whom have no criminal history. They have no other immigration history, so we felt that having something relatively close to the southwest border for those people what was an appropriate thing to do. And is, is there any um, mechanism for, of oversight on the transfer policy? Because I can tell you my day-to-day -day experience. I was in Basile uh, two days ago on Friday uh, doing our regular know, right, know Your Rights presentations. And the first question I ask is, where were you arrested? Please raise your hand. Alabama, Tennessee, Mississippi, et cetera, our five states. And I always get at least a few hands, New York, Virginia, Miami. And so I don't know, you know how this policy is actually being carried out, but we are still seeing um, people who have been transferred long distances, uh, and they continue to be the grist of our mill, that is, the people that we end up representing, um, because they are especially uh, far from their families and have often uh, the most compelling cases. You know, I, I can't guarantee you that no one gets transferred anymore because there are circumstances where transfer is appropriate, but if, if you're familiar with the facilities in Louisiana, uh, you know that, that they were getting hundreds and sometimes thousands of people from the Northeast, right? Are you seeing that today? It, it's Be honest. It's substantially better. Uh, better? It's substantially better. <laughs> okay. Um, so we did add detention space in, in New, New York and New Jersey where the bulk of your population was coming from. And I'm not saying you don't get any from, from out of Louisiana, but uh, we did the same thing in California. We, we were sending uh, hundreds and again sometimes thousands of people arrested in California as far away as El Paso uh, and we added uh, a detention space in California to be able to keep them in the state so you know does, does no one get transferred well that that's, of course they do some people do get transferred for a variety of reasons but the, the mass transfer of people from the Northeast South and from California East you know has essentially stopped 
And then we have somebody in the back raising their hand. I'm Abdullahi. Uh, just to follow back on your, I mean, on your comment about the justification behind transferring detainees from one state to another, can you elaborate, please, on some of those justifications ICE has? Sure. Uh, as we were discussing over here, uh, you know, there could be certain uh, specialized circumstances, medical, for example. Uh, we could have someone who's subject to mandatory detention, and, and we just can't provide the medical care uh, for them in a particular location. We would move them. Uh, we do, from time to time, have detainees ask to be transferred for you know, certain personal reasons. Uh, th those tend to be the, the type of cases. It, it is not... Uh, as it was a couple of years ago, because we just don't have the detention space. Uh, it has to be some very, very specific individual circumstance, and we try extremely hard, even when those circumstances exist, uh, not to move someone who, who has an attorney uh, in, in an area. That would be an absolute last resort, and it would have to be something very unusual to move someone who was represented by, a, by an attorney. Back here. Thank you. My name is Heidi Altman. I'm here with the Capital Area Immigrants Rights Coalition. Um, my question goes back to the conversation from a few minutes ago regarding mandatory detention. And I'd like to ask a, a question about the, the folks, the population of individuals who are covered by Section 230 um, So I think when we have these conversations, there's often sort of an underlying assumption that individuals with criminal convictions are appropriately within the immigration detention system, and I'd like to question that assumption. Um, we're often talking about individuals who are here lawfully um, and whose placement in the immigration detention system really devastates um, families and communities, really severe uh, both financial and social ramifications. Um, we've seen reports of children uh, shuttled into the foster care system as an extreme example. Um, additionally, these are all folks for whom the criminal justice system has made a determination that they are not a risk to the community. They've either served their sentence or been released um, on the determination of a judge in the criminal justice system. So my question is what your thoughts are um, for this population of folks, whether there is any appetite um, for changing and modifying that section of the INA as part of comprehensive immigration reform, um, or rather whether in the interim, if there's any movement perhaps, or any room for um, executive action in terms of prosecutorial discretion policies, um, and considering at the outset um, of the, you know, of sort of a placement of someone in the immigration detention system, um, whether this type of detention is, is always appropriate. Thank you. Well, I guess the short answer is we, we make, uh case-by-case -case determinations based on criminal history, immigration history. And, um, you know, we, we've backed that up with some recent uh, other policy decisions. I mean, you, you're probably aware of the change in our detainer policy where uh, people who, uh, you know, have, have been charged with relatively minor crimes and, and don't have a, a more serious criminal history, we don't even place detainers on them anymore. Um, but the, the issue of whether or not a, a, a person you know, poses an ongoing threat to the community just because they've uh, served their, their original criminal sentence is you know, a, a, an interesting one to debate. Uh, I mean, many of you know, particularly those of you that have been involved in the criminal justice system, that anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of people who have been convicted of crimes will reoffend within three years. And you know which of us, you know, has has the wisdom to know which which one of those is going to be. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. So, uh, you know, w we do our best to decide outside of those that are mandatory, which ones pose a threat to the community, and you know we do our best to to detain them. Uh, you know, a, a, an interesting case recently right here in D.C. Um, if I were to tell you all that that we put a detainer on someone and took them into custody and removed them, and, and this, is, this is their background. Well, they, they uh, had no prior immigration history. They were charged with and convicted of a misdemeanor, and they did 180 days here in the D.C. jail. You can say, okay, well, that, that person probably shouldn't have had a detainer, and they probably shouldn't have been detained. They probably shouldn't have been removed, except for the fact that this was the notorious D.C. groper, the gentleman who was riding around DuPont Circle terrorizing the women there. You know, who of us would say it wasn't appropriate for us to detain him and, and remove him from the country? You know, and, and you know, that, that spectrum of what, what's serious and what's not is, is really hard to, 
you know, to, to come to an agreement on it. So it's, it's hard. And, and we, you know, we try and make the best decisions we can uh, based on the, the information we have. Hi, I'm Chris Daly with Just Ascension International. And first, thanks to Human Rights First for getting this panel together. I can't imagine a trio who have more expertise about what ICE has been doing in the last several years to move closer to a civil detention system. So I really appreciate you all being here. Um, you've obviously spoken about a number of the efforts that you've made, whether it's the national detention standards or the forthcoming PREA regulations, some of your other programs. The concern that we have at JDI and a number of other organizations have is the 80 to 90 percent of your detainees who are held in contract facilities. And so I'd love to just hear about some of the successes and challenges you've had in getting those standards applicable within those facilities and then monitoring to make sure that they're actually implemented. Yeah, and I know this is a, you know, a hot button issue. You know, the, the, there are companies who uh, are clearly doing this uh, not out of any sort of patriotism or altruism, and they, they are doing this because it makes a profit. There is absolutely no doubt about that. Um, and, and, and that's something we have to be concerned about, that you know, their, their profit motive doesn't uh, you know, get in the way of appropriate conditions of confinement. Uh, and, and as Margot described, we have an extremely robust and multi-layered uh, oversight system to, to ensure ourselves that they are doing the right thing. On the other side of the coin, uh, some of our uh, most what, uh, promising facilities in terms of civil detention reform, like Carnes, uh, like Broward, um, I'm trying to think of a couple others, uh, are you know, either owned or owned and operated by private companies. And, and one of the advantages of having a, a private company is is in fact this profit margin they, or profit motive. They will, they will do whatever you pay them to do. And, and so the ability to get exactly what you want, like, like in a Carnes, uh, is, is much easier in, in a private setting than it is you know, trying to get a, a county sheriff who has a lot of competing interests to put up or, or modify a facility to address civil detention standards. So it's a, again, it's a, you know, an interesting balancing act. I, I think that, um you know, it's very hard to do robust oversight if you have three people here and five people there and six people there. Um, uh, and so if you're going to consolidate uh, where uh, detainees are housed, um, you're either going to have them in kind of wings of local jails, right, where they're, they're sort of done in separate pods and have separate um, stuff going on, or they're going to be in, in private facilities. Um, if you're going to have them in non-jail-like settings, as, for example, the ABA has just, you know, proposed ought to be the requirement, well, either the federal government is going to build those or private companies are going to build them. And I, I don't know which of you is a good enough lobbyist to get the federal government to fund those kinds of facilities, but... Um, like, I know it wouldn't be a job I would take on. I mean, so, so if there's going to be non-jail-like settings, if that's the goal, they're, they're going to be private. Um, otherwise, you're going to have people in jails. Now, even jails can be made less jail-like if you've got enough people and if you sort of alter the rules somewhat. But I think what Gary said is, I, I'd be interested to hear what Dora thinks about it too, but I think what Gary said is probably right, that the number of sheriffs who are willing to change the way they do things for ICE detainees, it's not high on sheriff's lists to sort of say, yeah, I'm running a jail, but I'm gonna run a civil detention that feels really different in this pod. It's just, I, I don't say there are no sheriffs who would do it, but it, it, it's, it's hard to picture um, exactly how that works. So if you're gonna have non-jails, you're not gonna feel like you're in a jail, it, 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 it's probably going to be a private facility. And private facilities raise all kinds of ideological issues. I get it. I totally get it. But um, when we're talking about the realm of the possible, those are your choices. So um, as a jailer, I have, for a number of years, had strong, very public positions that are anti-privatization. So I, I want to put that out there first. Um, 
in Missouri when there was terrific growth, when truth and sentencing kicked in, um, private prisons as a temporary measure um, seemed to be a viable alternative. My experience is they weren't because as you put people in, in another jurisdiction with different expectations, the conditions are appreciably different. In Arizona, the state legislature mandated the state, and this is true in some other jurisdictions as well, to privatize a certain number of their beds. And quite candidly, in those circumstances, you're not the customer anymore, it's the state legislature, and so they're not always as responsive to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the state administrators who are ultimately responsible for how those facilities uh, operate. Having said all that, <clears throat> right now, um, the, the, gover the federal government owns seven, I think, facilities that are longstanding. They're legacy facilities that carried over from INS. But even under INS, they were, had not been operated for I don't know how many years by government. They had always been largely, for many years, had been privatized in, in terms of their operation. Having, I gave you my background because in the, in the time that I was at ICE and in my many conversations with the private sector and with sheriffs, I came, and so my, my conclusions now are a couple years old, but I think they're still largely relevant. Given the choice, I, I found myself preferring to deal directly with the private sector than to operate through sheriff's departments who, quite frankly, had very little investment of a professional sort in, in the operation of those facilities, the sector to build these beds on their behalf using private sector capital. Initially, it was to scoop up and take advantage of US Marshal prisoners. When state systems were short, they were also housing state prisoners, either from that state or from other states. Um, but but the, the sheriffs mostly get this pass-through, some money off the top. To, to you know, describe it plainly, and uh, and then the, the private sector operated those facilities. So it, in all things, I think to to carry the theme from what Gary and, and Margot are saying is, the the government has the core responsibility for the for every individual who's in their custody, and no matter who delivers those services, whether they're community based or facility based, it's ultimately government that is always responsible for the safety and well being of the individuals in its care. And to the extent that governor, government creates far more robust methods of oversight real time at, within the facilities and then doubling back for both regular and extraordinary circumstances, um, we are better now than before. Having said all that, the, the, the providers, whether they're sheriffs or the private prison providers, there's virtually nothing that's new in the ICE standards or in the ABA standards that they're not already dealing with with their correction customers. And so part of me has some disbelief of, as to why they have so much difficulty delivering standards for one population that as a matter of case law and statute, they should already be providing for everyone in their population. Um, and so I, I think you know, continuing to be the most educated consumer government uh, and pressing for the highest degree of accountability from those who are, who are doing work on government's behalf um, is everybody's responsibility. It will take, uh, I guess, a couple more questions. Hi, my name is Catherine Ransom with the Investigative Reporting Workshop. Mr. Mead, you said that if you could remove everybody without detention, you, you, you would. Um, how you just got a lot of flack for releasing 2,000 uh, people. How restricted are you by by Congress um, from actually lowering the detention numbers? Yeah, that wasn't one of the best days in my life recently. And uh, uh, somebody asked me afterward if, if if that had anything to do with my decision to retire, and I said absolutely not. But it certainly convinced me it was the right decision. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, we, we have a number of mandates. A, a, a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, give us direction. And one of those, one of those uh, directions is, is what comes from Congress in the form of our appropriation. And in our annual appropriation, they uh, direct us to maintain an average daily population of, of 34,000 people. Uh, we've always interpreted that to mean uh, at the end of the year, uh, we would have 30, uh, for the year, we would have an average of 34,000. And when we released uh, what amounted to about 2,000 people uh, between early February and the end of February, uh, that was to make sure that we remain financially solvent through the end of the continuing resolution that was due to expire at the end of March. And, uh, you know, ha had we continued with that, uh, we were still... Uh, you know, confident that we would, at the end of the year, uh, get close to, uh, if not maintain, that 34,000, because one of the reasons why uh, we were looking at a, uh, a potential financial shortfall was that uh, we had uh, exceeded 34,000 a day in custody for, for most of the six months leading up to that. Uh, we, we entered into the fiscal year with, I don't know if I remember, it was 35-something or low 36,000s in custody, and, and so we were, in effect, burning over budget for that part of the year. But, but Congress is, uh, you know, very interested in, uh, you know, the, their level of oversight. And, and one, one part of that is, you know, the funding to maintain 34,000 beds. Uh, these two, and I think we're going to wind down afterwards. Uh, Carl Takeo from the ACLU. One of the, um, the things that I, has been a, an ongoing problem with is with these contract facilities, you have contracts of a certain duration. And so, for example, with the performance-based standards, there are a large number of facilities that are only required by contract to operate under the older standards. Uh, or with the PREA regulations that have been proposed, substantively, there are many things that are praiseworthy about uh, those proposed regulations, but they, there's no provision to proactively apply those to facilities um, that are not currently uh, governed by good standards. And I wanted to know um, what uh, plans or ideas you have about making sure that when good standards are in place, they are in fact uniformly implemented across all of the contract facilities. Yeah, uh, it, is, it is our intention uh, that the new standards will be the standards of all facilities eventually, regardless of whether they're a true county facility, a, a private facility operated on behalf of a county, a, a private facility with a direct contract to us or any of our own uh, facilities, all will come under the new standards. Uh, and we are in negotiations with a, with a number of them, regardless of whether they've got a one-year contract or a multi-year contract, to get them there. Uh, some of the issues surrounding it uh, are that, uh, while, as Dora said, there's nothing revolutionary in our standards. I mean, everything that's in our standards exists somewhere in the country in some facility, whether it's a federal prison or a state prison or a county jail or a halfway house or whatever. It exists somewhere. Uh, but, for example, one of the things we would like to have in all of our facilities is contact visitation. Well, if they're in a facility that doesn't have... The, the, the physical setup to be able to get detainees and visitors you know, to a common place, they've got to figure out how to do that. And if that requires construction, that it's going to require cost. And, and so we're, we're negotiating through a lot of those issues with, with facilities. Uh, we would like to have you know, a minimum of four hours outdoor rec every day. Well, if, if the facility is only staffed for one hour, then they may need to hire some additional people. They may need to create doorways into larger rec areas so more people can get out at the same time. So those are the sorts of issues we're, you know, we're working through with uh, not all the facilities simultaneously, but focusing on our largest facilities first and you know, leaving the, the, you know, the small jail in, in, in the middle of wherever that has an average daily population of one, uh, you know, they, they may be last on our list to implement the changes. I will say this, there's no odds in writing standards that you don't intend to implement. I, the, the, the promulgation of the 2011 PBNDS was an enormous undertaking by um, ICE and the department. Um, it was
thousands and thousands of hours of time. And so uh, you should conclude from that that there's every intention of implementing those standards, right? Um, uh, and so uh, there's a few where it's implemented, there's a few more where we expect to be able to say soon that you know they've signed on the dotted line and then just kind of keep on pushing. Last question here and then we'll break up. Uh, thank you. Karen Grise from Freed Frank here in Washington, D.C., and past chair of the ABA Commission on Immigration. Um, I wanted to return to the question about what could get those detention uh, stays that are substantially over 30 days down into that 30-day or less period, and note that um, quite frequently, to their credit, judges are continuing cases detain cases in particular two times, three times, sometimes seven or eight times to allow people to try to seek counsel. And this goes back to the point about the remoteness of detention facilities. But one thing um, that it seems would help a lot to avoid not only the time delay, but also the expense of repeated on the record hearings would be an expansion of LOP to all the facilities so that everybody has the opportunity to find out if they have a claim at all. Ex experience is that um, claims dissolve. Nobody wants to stay in detention for nothing if they know they have no opportunity for relief. So the first question would be um, whether there's any thought about expansion of LOP or particularly, um, my understanding is that, that in Oakdale it's forbidden, not the government paid LOP, but external LOP is simply not allowed in the facility. And I, I wonder how that situation uh, jives with ICE's goals. Um, and the, the second question is for the vulnerable populations, d detainees generally, but in particular mentally ill or mentally disabled, is there any thought given to appointed counsel to offset the time and money delays of those perpetual continuances? Uh, I guess let me take the easiest one first, which is an I don't know answer. I mean, I, I'm not aware that uh, Oakdale prohibits uh, any sort of legal education. It is a BOP-run facility, as, as you probably know, but I'll, I'll certainly find out about that. Uh, you know, getting additional funding for uh, additional, you know, LOP, uh, it, it is certainly something that we would we would support. We don't fund that. Uh, we don't have the ability to control that appropriation. But uh, you know, it, it, you're right. I mean, people who who don't have a claim, uh, you you would hope uh, would be uh, quicker to to you know, accept a, an order and, and go home rather than spending <coughs> months in detention for for no obvious outcome. Uh, so you know we, we don't we don't disagree, and, and maybe that's something that's under consideration as part of CIR that you, you could do some calculation that says you know for for X percentage in reduction in in what we're paying for jail bills, uh, we could fund additional legal education and you know Im improve it that way. But uh, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you. Thank our panel, excellent panel, very uh, robust. <laughs> And, and also to uh, commend you all for your questions and critiques and criticisms. This makes it, this is what makes the system better. Thank you very much.